the problematic nature of what is called as neutrality. See, when you when you don't see the discrimination you practice because you're supposedly being, uh, you know, what is it called, being even-handed, where that even-handedness is uh, situated is something that we very often do not critically look at. And how much of this needs to be informing, in fact, all areas in which we do research and um, is something that is the reason why we felt it was important that we have this particular workshop so that those of you who are already kind of cognizant, it deepens your understanding and those who are not, it opens your eyes to what is it that you don't you have been missing out or where is it that you are blindsided. So uh, I would request Professor Kanan to start uh, this presentation and then we'll go as we go along at uh, uh, Vasanthi is going to be taking care of the moderation, but uh, how we want to work out the methodology, I think, is something uh, we can devise as we go. But over to you, uh, Dr. Kamil. Thanks a lot. Thanks, uh, words. Uh, I'm audible. Can you hear me? Are you are. Yeah. So the uh, uh, issue or the topic I have taken is basically a very important one. Uh, important one in the sense that uh, you know, from my point of view as a social sociologist or a social science teacher, and often uh, uh, we get uh, students. Uh, uh, you know, working on some research. And uh, so especially if the research is related to caste. And mostly uh, we get a kind of a proposal or a research uh, themes, which are mostly, you know, as uh, yesterday also we were discussing, it's kind of a, you know, policy studies kind of a research, what they propose. And uh, nothing wrong in doing policy research, but I think uh, one has to ask whether we have to do that in the PhD one. And uh, this is uh, uh, very important because this is a uh, you know, intellectually you are equipping yourself uh, for uh, higher learning through PhD. So in that context, we should not just simply uh, do a kind of a policy research. So why I'm saying this? is that uh, the kind of a uh, research proposal, especially on cars we get, mostly the implementation of certain uh, uh, human rights legislation or civil rights legislations, or uh, uh, sometimes uh, you know, the proposals which basically addresses the implementation of certain uh, policies of the uh, So, and uh, what is the real problem with this is that uh, mostly they don't ask any theoretical questions, and uh, and also they never ever uh, try to look beyond uh, the immediate reality or try to go beyond uh, certain uh, crisis, because I think mostly the law students uh, are very, you know basically policy oriented, they just look for some kind of a amendment to the existing act or some new policy which they want to propose. So the, my lecture here is to basically to uh, go beyond this uh, kind of a, uh, work which we usually do it in the legal context, especially I'm talking about the past. So mostly how whether PCR Act is uh, implemented properly, or ACST Prevention of Atrocities Act 89 is implemented, uh, implemented properly, what are the problems with it? Or uh, manual scavenging is the, the, the act which basically abolishes manual scavenging, whether that is implemented or not. So that is the kind of question. So I'm not saying these are all irrelevant. I'm saying uh, we have to ask some questions or some theoretical questions 
by making this as a, you know we have to uh, in a sense uh, uh, bring certain kind of uh, complexities in asking questions so that is the kind of uh, foregrounding i am doing for this chapter. so when we say law uh, and uh, social justice i'm trying to discuss this recognition and this is that thing so when we usually look at uh, this law and social justice or law leading to social justice basically what we have in mind is uh, the three important normative notions equality dignity and autonomy so these are the three important notions uh, maybe notions which are falling under this uh, kind of a broad category mostly we are addressing this and uh, when we look at this as a important notions normative notions uh, to understand social justice in the context of caste i in you know i'm trying to understand only the caste in the, not in the caste system in general but i am trying to under, understand dalit identity dalit question and probably if you want to extend that to the uh, other backward classes so so in that context we are discussing this so when we say the legal intervention in this issues as i said that we have a provision of uh, you know the protection of civil rights act and then the scst provision of atrocity act then the manual uh, abolition of manual scavenging legislation and uh, these are the most important thing which basically uh, you know which we got over the last uh, few decades to address the caste question uh, or caste discrimination against uh, antisocialists or the uh, quote unquote antisocialists because antisocialism is abolished legally. Uh, so when we say this, this legal intervention in terms of certain legislative interventions, we see that, uh, you know, this legal interventions, I understand, uh, especially these legislations, and one thing I just forgot to mention is the kind of affirmative policies also under uh, legal interventions. So when you take this entire uh, uh, domain, so we can easily make out that this legal intervention has two major concerns. One is a redistribution concern. Other is a recognition concern. All these acts. And uh, in a sense that, uh, you know, the moment we say this, uh, this legal intervention has these two elements of redistribution as well as recognition as a part of its, uh, um, you know, thinking or part of its uh, policy design. And uh, most of us, we think that uh, redistribution is done and recognition is done. Okay, because it is legally uh, given. So therefore it is done. So there's no need to really think or debate about it. But in my view, as this, whether it's a redistribution or recognition, it, in my view, it's a kind of a dual process. Dual process in a sense, why I'm saying this, uh, you know, this recognition and redistribution is continuously fought and continuously fought and retained by the Dalit scientists. And uh, otherwise, this uh, the legally given idea of redistribution and recognition is always compromised in the civil society as well as uh, particularly I'm uh, you know, targeting the judiciary. In the recent past, you might have seen whatever the you know, cases, people go to the Supreme Court or High Court on reservations. Invariably, we don't get any kind of a very favorable uh, verdict for the marginalized. And mostly they think in terms of uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, merit, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, they say that, uh, you know, we are, um, you know, we have to really question our constitutional commitment to reservation. And the government also, one after another, they are continuously going to Supreme Court and altering this commitment. Especially, we have to look at this economically, you know, uh, so economic, uh, you know, this EWS, economic repressation. 
uh, posting. So this economic weaker section posting, where where will they take? Because uh, they say that we have only 50 percent recognition with an allow. But uh, this uh, this 10 percent is within that 50 percent. If it is within that 50 percent, it will affect the OBCs and the CS and And if it is beyond that, then they themselves violating their own uh, decision of 50 percent maximum. So there, there are many problems to be. So when we look at this, and my view is whether it's a redistribution or recognition, is not actually given by any system, legal system. There is an effort on the part of the state to do that. But it, I think the people who are you know, engaging with this are continuously fighting with the system, continuously engaging with the system. And they retain this notions of redistribution, not just given like by the state policy. But large number of studies, uh, legal studies, uh, are done only to understand the failures of uh, implementation of these acts. And uh, mostly, you know, most of the studies which I have read, uh, which I have, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, just to read this for teaching my undergraduate courses. But mostly, I think it is basically the implementation problems, the failures. And they don't ask real, uh, they don't ask any theoretical question or they don't have any philosophical questions that they engage with. So in this, what I'm trying to uh, basically do here is that uh, by bringing this entire theoretical debate on tribulation and redistribution in the West, and not much done in India. But of course, uh, Indian scholars also participated in this. But uh, it is originated basically among the, uh, the Western. Kanan, could you speak a little louder? Uh, yeah. Is it, uh, is it clear, madam? Yeah, this is better. OK. So, uh, so mostly, I'm trying to understand or trying to locate this entire problematic within the theoretical debates uh, on recognition and uh, redistribution. Why it is uh, this two important uh, uh, concepts or a debate on recognition and redistribution is important because it gives a lot of insights for students, a lot of insights for the students who are really interested in social justice, human rights. But they can get a lot from these debates. So that is why I'm bringing this inside here. And it's nothing, it's no original idea uh, from me. I'm just basically sharing with you the kind of debates and the relevance of that in the past. That is the only thing I'm doing. There's nothing, no original contribution from me in this lecture. So, uh, so when we say this, uh, the, the concept of recognition, uh, the concept of recognition, uh, you know, you know, usually uh, we always define the concept and then move forward. Okay. So I just let me start with the concept of recognition, as uh, discussed by the Western philosophers like uh, Charles Tyler and Axel Gunnar and Nancy Fraser. And there are many, many. You now, this entire debate on recognition, I would say it is even started with German idealism of this. And uh, even Hegel gave a major uh, interpretation of recognition, but that's entirely a philosophical, very phenomenological way of explaining. And, uh, but here I'm not going to get into that. If that is the case, we have to spend a lot of time in discussing this philosophical work. I'm not going that side, but I'm trying to discuss only within the social theory and political theory context, which is recognition and literacy. Uh, so recognition uh, is a process that makes difference in the way its its bearers or climbers treat by treated by others. Okay, so uh, recognition is a process that makes a difference in the way its bearers are climbers treated by others. And perhaps even shaping the terms in which she or he understand herself or himself. 
and how this in turn helps to configure have uh, his power and possibilities. So this definition itself is very profound. And we say that it's a recognition is basically a process, social process. In this process, the bearer who is claiming or way aiming for recognition uh, is treat how they are treated by others and even how others perception or how others position even shape uh, in the, 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 the bearer or the person who is expecting recognition and how that person understands herself or himself. So in the implied assumption is there is a self and there is the other. And the self is always constructed in relationship with the other. Okay. So, uh, so in this uh, context and uh, uh, when, when a person when a self is trying to configure uh, her or his power and possibilities. So naturally, when there is a recognition from the other in a, in a social context, and it always we try to understand this recognition in terms of the possibilities of your living, possibilities of your relationship, and the possibilities of your empowered situation. So therefore, this concept of recognition becomes very, very uh, important in our context. So uh, since we have this uh, broad uh, definition of uh, recognition, recognition also addressed in the uh, social theory context at two levels. One is uh, basically trying to understand in terms of, uh, you know, uh, normative level. The other one is psychological recognition. Normative is basically the both philosophy, political theory, and social theory to some extent trying to understand. And the psychological uh, thing also comes from anthropology, social anthropology, and uh, uh, more, uh, the pure psychology sports. So when we say normative, basically the normative way of recognizing is how you in the mutual process, in the mutuality, how you treat the other person normatively as your equal. How you recognize the other person you know, has certain dignity. Other person has certain kind of a self. So you approach that very normative. And because you treat that person as your equal, and you agree that the other person has a dignity and self respect Okay, this is a very normative way of addressing the recognition. But a psychological way of understanding recognition is this the process of self and other. And in the social context, we always construct my uh, self by looking at the other. So this is how in sociology we talk about, uh, you know, looking glass self by Charles Hatton Cooley. So I mean Margaret Mead has written about this. So they just basically talk about how this self, a social self, a self as an individual, understood or constructed in, in relation with the other. The other is playing a very important role in constructing the self. Okay. But the other is also a self in some sense. For the other, the self also has the other self. So this is a continuous process. So uh, Mostly in psychology, recognition is how this particular self is addressed by the other. Because you all the time think about yourself, how the other person thinks about yourself. Whether the other person is really, you know, you know, very important person like you, but the other person is equivalent of you, how he thinks about you. Yourself is constricted. Whether the other person is not that equal, but also thinks about you. Okay, so this is a constant interaction in which we construct ourselves. So this is more of a, a psychological way of understanding the recognition process. So uh, this, uh, in this context, <coughs> sorry, when we try to understand the recognition. The understanding of uh, recognition, in a sense, has served a connecting point between broad philosophical inquiries 
about the realization of freedom and intersubjectivity. Okay. So when we take this entire discussion, particularly the normative as well as the psychological discussion to another level, this, uh, you know, it, this recognition is the connecting point between uh, broad philosophical inquiries about the realization of freedom and intersubjectivity. When we say realization of freedom, we are basically talking about individualized claim for recognition. That's a freedom. Individualized claim for recognition. Freedom. And intersubjectivity here, a kind of a dialogue, dialogic process of uh, trying to understand uh, the kind of uh, the other person or the relationship in a more uh, dialogic fashion or otherwise uh, in uh, social theory uh, we call or even people organize it as a, uh, trying to understand the intersubjectivity or interbeings and because my my existence as Kanna is it cannot it cannot happen uh, without my intersubjectivity, my various others. So this intersubjectivity is not just uh, only a self-activity, not the other, the, the other is very much there. But we all the time we see my being is actually the, the other person is also is part of this being. So we see that our existence is a kind of a, a kind of interbeing. And we all the time intersubjectively understand each other. Not that I always try to understand myself from my point. So the intersubjectivity has to happen. So in that sense, uh, you know, this intersubjectivity is uh, basically trying to uh, understand uh, the recognition gives you to understand these two kind of things, freedom and intersubjectivity. Okay. So this idea of intersubjectivity <coughs> you look at closely this uh, issues were brought up in various contexts like education issue education whether and uh, whether uh, the entire the researchers uh, done in the west about education attainment of the black children white children and what are the kind of uh, the issues the black children face and uh, especially the official language policy issues we talk about the definition. So we have uh, in India, we have the constant problem of uh, official language policy because you have a, uh, uh, yes, a government, a state, which basically tries to understand uh, language in terms of one single language for the entire uh, nation. Thereby, in a sense, uh, it, it's kind of a misrecognition, technically of the other languages, other linguistic uh, communities in Indian context or in any other uh, country. So we see this uh, idea of recognition used in official language policy issues. We've seen that people talk about Aboriginal rights, gay and lesbian rights, all these things, uh, these parts of self recognition used very wide. So therefore, it is very important to understand the recognition concept in the caste context, also, in the context of how the social justice is ensured by law, how this deals with this recognition and also redistribution. That is what uh, we are uh, trying to do here. <coughs> Sorry. So this entire uh, debate between this uh, recognition and redistribution happened uh, in the 80s and uh, 90s, theoretically. But I think this entire uh, thing on recognition and redistribution, in my view, started even in the 60s in Europe. Because the entire group who insisted only on identity, or identity, Gay and lesbian feminist group. So, in the 60s, uh, th that that was the point of uh, time to talk about. That is where this entire theoretical debate emerged. And uh, but it, though it emerged at that point of time, it 
uh, gets some kind of a consolidation or it's solidified in the 80s and 80s. We have uh, great thinkers reflecting on this uh, issue of the definition of identity uh, politics. So what was the basic concern or attention is that, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, you know, what we see this, the entire political spectrum, the entire political domain, there was a fear from the traditional, uh, traditional in a sense that radical, traditional radical political actors like Marxist. And uh, they had a fear that this entire identity claims, the identity uh, formation or the claims of identity, group identity, collective identity or individual identity is in a sense uh, taking over, you know, in a sense it is, it, it takes away the marginalized uh, uh, from addressing the real problem of inequality. People are more interested in, in identity politics rather than addressing the inequality in the economic and economic, economic domain, most political domain also. So Marxists were highly suspicious of this entire tendency of because it's the entire political movement is just push uh, to, to the other side. And uh, so they started responding to this movement, social movement as in 60s and 70s. And the result is that you got a, you, you started getting theories and uh, concepts in the 80s uh, to various postmodernist writings. So in that uh, context, uh, this debate is located. On the one hand, Marxist, the, the radical uh, groups who are talking about the redistribution and the other group are basically talking about the recognition or identity. Okay. So this, this is the uh, issue which we are uh, discussing here. Uh, the debate basically between recognition and redistribution more broadly between the problem of identity based injustice and the problem of economic injustice to put it in another way the debate is broadly between the problem of identity based injustice injustice can be addressed in terms of your identity also it's not just merely mere inequality in the economic domain. And therefore, the problem of economic injustice is a concern of the redistribution uh, debate. And uh, the identity based injustice becomes central to the recognition. Okay. Okay. So, this, this is the, uh, the broader concern they had when they started the debate. So when we say this, the uses, the uses of recognition, and especially there are two important uh, documents, predictive, uh, uh, which uh, provoked uh, a recent surge of interest in the idea of recognition. And this one is uh, Charles Taylor's work in 1994, the politics of recognition, and also he has written even before that, or I think the sources of self. So philosophically, he's a communitarian philosopher. Charles Taylor's work in the politics of recognition. And the other one is uh, from a Frankfurt School critical theory called a student of Jürgen Kebermas called Axel Hohner. H-O-N-N-E-T-H. Axel, A-X-E-L. Axel Hohner. And his uh, uh, like. Uh, book or article and later it was given as a Tanner's lecture also very important uh, lecture and uh, it's called the struggle for recognition that was uh, that came out in 1996 so what is this two important documents and uh, they are not actually opposing each other in this one is uh, a communitarian philosopher, rather is a philosopher from uh, critical theory, Frankfurt School. They are not actually contradicting here, but one is trying to move 
you know advance uh, you know advances the theoretical reflection more deeper so that is what uh, you know that is how i understand so therefore i don't find that as a very contradictory thing so tyler's essay particularly the politics of the generation uh, after discussing these two i'll give you a small uh, pass to if you have any questions so that we can because it's going to be a bit uh, consistently theoretical today, so that you can, you can clarify and move further. So Tyler's essay was partly an effort to move, uh, to make a sense of political landscape of the time. And uh, partly a transposition of the liberal communitarian debates of the 1980s into onto a press direct. So what uh, Taylor is doing in this what in the essay is that uh, he tries to bring his own community and philosophy to understand uh, to the present context of uh, the people struggling for recognition and people asking for identity. So he basically brought that his theory, his philosophy to this. Uh, what is his central problem? I think what he says about this. He says his target is his criticism is not ma that much of a postmodernist something. His target, as usual, like a communitarian target, the liberals. So liberal communitarian, but uh, they have some kind of a debate with, among themselves. So the communitarian critique of the uh, liberals. So what he says is the politics of recognition, the, the SSA, in which people seek to transform the ways in which they are seen, are esteemed by others. And uh, so he says, this is, I'm just uh, uh, quoting uh, Charles Taylor, the politics of recognition in which people seek to transform the ways in which they are seen and esteemed by others. And so to satisfy the deeply rooted human Need. So for Charles Taylor, recognition is deeply felt human need. It's not just a courtesy that I recognize also. You know, I see someone, I feel the presence of others. It's not the it's it's not your cultural courtesy. For Charles Taylor, recognition is a deeply felt human need. It's not just some some shallow so that's what he says. Uh, the politics of recognition in which people seek to transform the ways in which they are seen and they esteemed by others, and so to satisfy the deeply, deeply rooted human need to be recognized as the bearer of a distinctive identity. So here he says that uh, there is a deep need, there's a deeply felt need. It's a human need that your distinctive identity, not as an individual, it could be at the community level, needs to be recognized. That is very important human need. You can't just understand everyone as a, 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 a human, like what human rights, natural law human rights says. You have a human rights because you are a human. Okay, it's a universalized understanding. So what he says is that uh, this understanding of distinctive identity could be completely submerged in this entire uh, liberal discussion on universal notions of rights, universal paradigm of rights. So for him, that is basically liberal. Right? The notion of the rights, the way they are discussing the rights. It doesn't address this distinctive identity. Therefore, he calls, he argues, that the difference, quote, within quote, difference blind liberalism, because liberalism, it's only go for universalized categories, whether it is a right or uh, liberty, freedom, it's a universalized category. So the difference blind liberalism cannot adequately respond to this need of difference. Okay, like in India, there is a 
there is a constant effort not only part of the liberals but also it happens in the conservative side also they are not interested in the difference they wanted only unity there is no difference everything should be identical whatever we do there is only one including your ration card is one okay so what we think here is that uh, you know we are having a difference blind approach liberalism also had a difference blind approach in a di at a different level so uh, you know but this uh, this tendency of liberalism uh, tyler fields it's a very narrow it's a very narrow understanding because it understands the recognition uh you know it at the most it helps you to understand recognition at the individualized level not at the level of community not at the level of collective so basically when you universalize categories universalized way of understanding human agency autonomy or you know, rights so probably there is a tendency to go difference line the difference blind gives you a distinctive identity which is very necessary for the population okay. so this is this is what uh, uh, charles taylor is uh, trying to say in this uh, essay important essay for axel hunnath axel hunnath as i said is he comes from a very long tradition of uh, a german thinkers called frankfurt school and uh, he basically tries to bring both hegel as well as margaret mead in his work both the normative as well as psychological things he tries to bring but his major hold is hegelian but uh, you know for uh, for some you know if if, if it necessary we will go to hegel but otherwise it's not necessary for me to discuss here what uh, basically he tries to do in his work uh, he says um, recognition is not primarily a means to grasp such phenomena as the rise of identity identity politics or new social movements so for him the recognition is not primarily a means to grasp the politic identity politics or the new social movements new social movements are a, a stream of uh, you know i would say that's an entire field within sociology which studied about social movements because they categorize uh, they they you know they distinguish between new social movement and old social movement old social movements are basically class based and uh, mostly you know it's not actually talking in terms of any Uh, you know, localized understanding of uh, issues. It is always the old social movements for the universal uh, uh, thing. So, in that context, so what we see here is that uh, Axel Hornath is not actually moving towards that, and his understanding of uh, uh, recognition comes from his uh, tradition of Frankfurt School theory. and where he brings the whole issue of interceptivity uh, from his guru habermas and uh, on on onats account injustice is felt in the first instance not as the transgression of an explicit linguistic norm but as a denial of intersubjectivity recognition that violently disrupts subject relations to herself in natural injustice for khanna this is more deeper to understand the past politics in india so what he says injustice is 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 felt in the in the first instance not as a transgression of explicit linguistic norm but as a denial of intersubjective recognition so when the intersubjectivity recognition is violently disrupted the subject it disrupts the subject the self 
relationship to the self itself and uh, you know this interruption this kind of disruption uh, can affect the subject relationship to herself or himself whether through uh, physical abuse physical abuse we see that uh, dalits are haunted every day women are haunted every day okay so this kind of a physical abuse it's basically very violently disrupts the intersubjectivity of that human in relating with the other and when that is done that is injustice for him he is not discussing injustice in terms of historical injustice okay, that is a problem with the uh, axel bonner paradigm the historical injustice you know when you talk about injustice which is violently disrupting now in your in your context this also this violent disruption also happens in our society because of historical reasons we still treat uh, dalits dalit women particularly as uh, as a not at all a human you know we treat at a inhuman level and uh, you know even i very often i say this in my lecture when i did a project for mls uh, bangalore that when dalit women go to police station to give a complaint that they are uh, they are sexually abused the police people uh, person says uh, that okay what is wrong it's so natural to your community it's so natural so nothing wrong with people abusing sexually abusing you this a physical abuse of some and it violently disrupts the self relations with the self so this is injustice for axel bonner which basically disrupts the intersubjectivity relationship for constructs over the of that okay and uh, so it, it can happen through this physical abuse or the refusal of basic moral uh, the refusal of basic moral respect to legal protection classic example is india we have utter respect for legal protection of dalits and very openly government of india is saying there is no manual scavenging there is no manual scavenging death in it and very often you see it in the press people are you know, people are dying or dead in the manhole in the drainage okay so this is utter utter disregard for legal protection of the marginalized and uh, you know sometimes we see that uh, denigration of individual or collective ways of life in a sense uh, if a community claims a solidarity and esteem constantly work against that and demolish it if community claims that we have a esteem we are so good at this but there is no recognition for it okay so in that sense what you see here is that uh, you know uh, the violent disruption happens in the self and the protection you know at three levels he is saying physical abuse is first level second level is a uh, refusal of basic moral respect of uh, or legal protection and third level denigration and individual collective ways of life all the three happens in the list right and uh, so far i have not come across any research which studied the uh, acst prevention of atrocities atrocities act from this very often what they do with this this law is not implemented cases filed a different day so this is the usual study we come across because we don't ask theoretical questions we don't have any categories to approach the very fertile deep field of law law is almost a centralized entity organizing our life nowadays which is a bad thing for me i don't agree with that we our life should not be all the time regulated by law but that is what happening now okay so one has to ask certain questions theoretical questions i i look i locate this 
Axel Honnath's idea of injustice, the way he defines industry, it gives you my, you know, it, it's a you know, abundance of theoretical ideas to explore the agony, insult, humiliation that it's feel in Indian society. No law student who says really interested. Okay. So there's a vast field, but no one is exploring it. Okay. So this is in Axel, Axel Pannath's idea of recognition. Recognition is, you know, when injustice happens at an intersubjective level, it becomes a misrecognition. It's a usage in a psychoanalysis, but here we're using it in a different way. So this is misrecognition. So uh, misrecognition in the sense that uh, this there is a violent interruption, a dis disruption of your intersubjective community. Okay. So at that level, he speaks of uh, repetition. You see how uh, these two philosophers are just, uh, you know, moving in a very, very in a deeper manner to address the idea of repetition. So there are many scholars who written on recognition. I'm just taking only this book. And uh, uh, I'll try to expand this idea further after taking a few questions. Otherwise, it becomes a bit heavy. I feel that we have to take uh, uh, with the permission of uh, the Danda and uh, Dr. Vasati. Can I break for a few minutes take, to take questions and go further? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm sure we can do that. So do people, because it's a smaller group, do people want to unmute themselves? Or if there is any difficulty unmuting yourself, then uh, you can just type out a question in the box. No, I think it's better you ask question, unmute yourself and ask, because I have the cervical spondylus problem and read the message. No, 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 no. I will read out the messages. I'm yeah. just saying if there are any candidates uh, who want to who are not able to speak out, then they can type and then I will look at the question. Okay. But if you're able to unmute yourself and uh, ask questions, because I think it's very important. I think what Dr. Kanan has been, uh, uh, you know, uh, demonstrating or actually it's, it's, it's a very useful insight because reading up all of this literature is so difficult. Uh, but being able to locate your research within these paradigms is also absolutely critical for anyone who's engaging with questions of social justice. So it's, it would be very useful if you can ask the questions so that uh, you know we can take this discussion further. So your don't, questions don't have to be doubts about what he has already said. They could also be you know, uh, just trying to see if you have understood him correctly, if, if this is what he's saying. I think that would be very useful. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, you're audible, Abhinit. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, somewhere you mentioned something about uh, postmodernist literature on questions of uh, recognition and their relation to identity politics. Uh, can you can you just uh, elaborate a bit? I did not get clearly what is the connection between the two and uh, how they relate to each other. Okay, see, in the sixties in Europe. When uh, you know, when uh, the when people came out, especially the homosexuals, and especially the gay and lesbians came out and asking for their rights. And usually, in the European context, the political agent is only a class, class which marks uh, say who can bring change in the society. Only the working class. Working class is the prime mover of the revolution, who can bring social change. But what they found in the uh, 60s, and uh, people are not actually articulating their agency, political agency, not from any class background, but from in terms of identity, gay and lesbians, and which holds a whole lot of philosophers and Marxist thinkers, like including. Jean-Paul Sartre and uh, Samundegur 
and uh, Althusa, whole lot of people came out and started theorizing. Okay. And, but at the same time, this is from the Marxist discussion. They were trying to understand it. The other side, people were talking in terms of, see, the agency is not necessarily a class agency, but the agency can be articulated in terms of your identity. The kind of identity which you want to construct. Okay. So this identity construction took a big uh, of the kind of a shape in the Western context, particularly you. Later, it went to America also. So these people started uh, theorizing this uh, kind of a difference because they are saying that identity is not necessarily the same. Identity is different, multiple. So the black identity, black women identity is different from uh, the white women identity. Okay. So all identity differences came out very openly. So the whole lot of theorizing started happening that how this identity is so important to articulate one's agency. So in that sense, uh, there is a debate between the Marxists who are saying inequality should be addressed not uh, because the identity is almost recognition identity why people uh, asking of uh, their identity needs to be recognized legally and that happened almost after uh, five decades or six, six seven decades uh, in india people are asking for identity so you recognize the you know they are going to supreme court asking to legally approve the uh, same sex relationship which happened much earlier in the West. Okay. So what you see is this identity claim for certain identity is a recognition, is a need, felt need, a strong human need. Okay, like what Charles Taylor is saying. They are demanding their identity. It's a felt need. One cannot just simply ignore like what our Supreme Court did uh, when the Delhi High Court uh, Justice Murlidhar gave a favorable verdict and uh, which was stalled by the Supreme Court. Later, Supreme Court reversed its decision. That's a different story. But what we see, how this identity claims when people ask for their recognition, how it was dealt by the other here in the Supreme Court or larger civil society. So therefore, the identity question and recognition are, to some extent, are interconnected. Can okay. you just repeat that last line? You're saying um, identity and uh, recognition are on the same spectrum, but uh, this redistribution and recognition are seen as conflicting paradigms. Yeah. So because uh, the conflicting paradigm, because uh, identity recognition was addressing only the cultural identities. You are kind of a uh, political identity which doesn't have any connection to your economic your economic uh, situation. So therefore, the redistribution paradigm is talking in terms of redistribution of the goods, redistribution of goods in terms of aiming for equality, like uh, many theories of justice we have within legal theory and political theory, talking in terms of uh, justice as a fairness of John Rawls. So we they talk in terms of you know sharing of you know in a sense equally sharing of burden as well as the benefit that's the fairness okay here it is addressed in terms of goods opportunities that is a redistribution paradigm here it is only the identity paradigm we want what we want we don't bother about whether i am a dalit or i'm a brahmin but we want a women identity are we are whether we are a Dalit uh, or a Brahmin, we are lesbians. Doesn't matter. Or a uh, gay. So this identity tries to, in a sense, uh, transcends its social and economic. There is a possibility. The transcendence is objected by the Marxist and the people who are talking about this. But there is uh, some literature by Nancy Fraser. Yeah, yeah I'm coming. Talks to, I'm about coming, I'm huh, coming which talks that. about a possibility of you know addressing both, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm coming to that later. Yeah. Yes. 
Any other? I was just wondering, uh, Kannan, if you could uh, amplify a little bit more. There was one point at which you spoke about, uh, you know, starting to alter yourself in order to obtain recognition. You know, the way in which you present yourself uh, as a as a, a technique or a mechanism that people very often practice to obtain recognition. I just was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on that, that point that you made. Now, are you referring to this uh, Margaret Mead's idea about psychological recognition? Yeah, yeah. I was just, yeah. I, I was just wanting, I mean, I, because it caught my attention, so I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, I think it is uh, what uh, this anthropologist, uh, particularly uh, Margaret Mead, Ma before Margaret Mead, Charles uh, uh, Van not often mentioned in this writings, but is the original uh, in, uh, scholar who framed, came out with this looking glass self. Looking glass self is almost like what I'm doing now. I'm looking at my own uh, figure in the screen and talking to myself. This is a looking glass self. My self is formed. You know, in the same sense, the society is a glass for the other. There is a self. The self is always in interaction with the other. The other is the mirror. And then you formulate yourself and make sure that, uh, you know, the other could be at various levels. The other could be below your the self, what the self thinks that is below your divinity. And uh, or the, the other could be above. You think that they are above you. So it can happen. But in a some sense, uh, the mutual recognition happens between the equals. Mutual recognition happens only among the equals. So the mutual recognition, if at all, if you want to have a mutual recognition, it, it's possible, mostly possible within the uh, uh, the people who are in the equal uh, state. Uh, so therefore, we all the time constantly looking for framing ourselves in relation with the other. This is at, addressed at various levels, that's a psychological level, even uh, slightly Hegel also comes to that. And uh, even in Indian context, Jiddu Krishnamurti very beautifully elaborates the self and other uh, because that is how he becomes a bit uh, phenomenological. Okay. So, how this entire self is constructed in relation with the other. Okay. In the process, he says, Jiddu Krishnamurti says, in the process, you all the time construct yourself in relation with the other, you forget yourself. There is a real self. Okay, because you you are basically your self is constructed for the other in the process of relating with the other. That is a kind of a therapeutic, kind of a very uh, spiritual connection. But uh, Western thinkers don't bother about that and how this self is bought, you know, constructed in relation with the other. Okay. So that was actually a referring to. Please unmute yourself, madam. Uh, I, I thought that you shouldn't look at yourself, so I switched on my camera. <laughs> <laughs> so no, the no, I was just thinking that it's it's like um, in law somewhere very often you use that uh, that technique because you you seeking the approval of others that you try to put up a norm and you say if you act in a particular kind of way then the sort of acceptance that you may obtain is is greater so i was i was actually trying to make that connection in my head and that's why i was asking and and also of course you do have you know where uh, i mean for us one major crisis of not having a rule of law society is because everybody who's considered to be powerful or all people of privilege believe that privilege means not to follow the law. You know, the, the first kind of thing is that if you are following the law or you, you kind of feel that you just have to follow it and there's no choice in the matter, then necessarily uh, you are, you're somebody who's bottom of the line. Uh, it's, 
and you know that has had a huge influence on us not being a law abiding society because everybody feels that if i become if i'm really powerful then i can sort of you know brush aside whatever the law requires from me i'm just ex extrapolating from what you were saying there but i do think there's a very close connection on that students any questions only teachers are asking questions no it's not so easy to formulate questions <laughs> because what you have been talking about have been uh, are, are very very useful concepts but it's it's not very easy to be able to you know uh, immediately uh, ask the question so i think anyway, see, uh, the me methodology that we do follow once you your presentation is over we would give them about 10 minutes time to reflect yeah and you know we find that better questions come when students are allowed or people okay. applicants are allowed to kind of think about right. uh, what they want to ask sometimes people are not you know it's very not very easy to at once ask questions right. and it's like uh, like basanti is very correctly saying you require some mulling over about the the kind of points that you are making you know, so. okay so i will uh, proceed now to discuss the debate uh uh this is basically about the debate between i would say that it's not a debate one can call debate because uh, this is an anti fraser's very very powerful response to this entire theories of revolution why i say it's a powerful thing was because uh, anti fraser the, the, the level at which she trying to engage with this and uh, the kind of a commitment deep commitment she has to the emancipation of the modern era if one can really understand why she is uh, she is uh, expressing all her agony and suffering to just to, to retain her own position it's not just a mere cerebral nancy fraser is not at all a cerebral figure there are others but she is not that kind of a feminist so i have a highest regard for fraser and uh, fraser's uh, uh, basic uh, point is that uh, she found that there is a eclipse of uh, socialist imaginary and the rise of uh, politics focused on identity and particularity that's her and she found that there is a there is an eclipse of socialist imaginary and uh, the rise of uh, politics focus on identity identity and religion and basically fraser's writings in 1990s were basically investigating the conflicts that arise between the politics of recognition and the politics of redistribution and uh, in the in the struggle against uh, cultural uh, injustice the politics of recognition tends to promote the specificity of social groups while the politics of redistribution frequently works to undermine such specificity and uh, so what she says in the the politics of recognition tends to promote the specificity of social groups while the politics of redistribution is uh, frequently works to undermine such specificity this is this is what i said this is the kind of a response you get from nancy fraser as a kind of a critic of postmodernist feminism see what uh, fraser nancy fraser comes from a uh, particular thinking so when entire feminist movement started constructing a very very powerful uh, very consistent uh, agency 
all over the world from this movement. Suddenly, a group of scholars coming and saying that uh, no, the agency cannot be single, it should be multiple. So Dalit women agency is different from Brahmin women agency. Black women agency is different from white women agency. And uh, so the agencies are multiple. The identities are multiple. So basically the, the feminist, the postmodern feminist or the, the postmodern is thinking that uh, universalization is an injustice. You cannot just talk about universal identity. A universalized identity, like a class, working class, or something like that. Or women as one single category of the universe. Okay, you can't identify. That's a violence. Whereas the redistribution paradigm was basically working against such a specificity, it was working for the universalized understanding of uh, uh, understanding of skin equality and all those things. So that is the uh, kind of a context. Fraser's response to this uh, dilemma was uh, to introduce a cross-cutting distinction between two types of remedies. So Nancy Fraser has to address this. And Nancy Fraser felt that both are important. Politics of recognition is also important. As a Marxist coming from a Marxist background, she can't compromise on her redistribution also. So she has to, she's a, in a sense, uh, she engages with uh, the feminist writings and the postmodern feminism because uh, Nancy Fraser is very uncomfortable with the uh, plurality of identities, discreteness of identity. Okay, because she thought that this will destroy the emerging woman. It will destroy the emerging class consciousness, not if, if not class consciousness, destroy the entire agency of women. So from that angle, she says the discreteness is dangerous. So in that context, but at the same time, she recognizes that uh, the identity is very important. It has a very important element of agency. So one cannot just simply ignore it. So therefore, entire her response is trying to balance recognition and redistribution. That is her contribution. I just uh, say this and stop. So what is uh, she is uh, addressing? So Fraser's res response to this kind of a dilemma, redistribution or recognition. She introduced a category called the cross-cutting distinction between two types, uh, you know, especially her response to this is a cross-cutting uh, distinction. What is that cross-cutting distinction is uh, to understand the injustice, whether it's a cultural or political or economical. She brought uh, the first thing is affirmative remedies. Okay, so affirmative remedies, affirmative remedies uh, such as mainstream multiculturalism or liberal welfare politics, like in terms of uh, you know rights, political rights, and uh, all those things. Uh, welfare politics address unjust outcomes, conferring respect upon misrecognized groups are transferring resources to the underprivileged. This is affirmative remedies. Okay. There are two remedies, he says, to address this dilemma. Affirmative remedies basically at, uh, refers to a mainstream multiculturalism, how the multiculturalism insists on or allows multicultural groups to live together. Multiculturalism is important part of a uh, living. And uh, our liberal welfare politics basically addresses unjust outcomes. So like what we have in India and uh, unjust outcomes. And uh, all the time, uh, you know, definitely we have unjust society. And uh, the way what we do politicking is basically trying to rectify this unjust. But in the process, uh, in, in the process, we confer respect upon misrecognized groups like Dalits, Adivasis. We confer that. And uh, transferring resources to the underprivileged. So these are all part of that kind of affirmative strategies. 
Then she talks about transformative remedies. By contrast to the affirmative remedies, uh, affirmative remedies by contrast such as choir politics. Choir politics or socialism addresses address the underlying generative framework that gives rise to unjust condition in the first place. Destabilizing hierarchies of identity and fundamentally altering the relations of production. So the transformative remedies, he again she brings to here, recognition and redistribution. She says choir politics is politics of recognition, and she brings socialism also. What she says here, underlying generative framework that gives rise to unjust conditions in the first place. So when people are asking for rights, equal rights, when the when the choir movement is asking for a revolution, or the working class asking for the equality, uh, socialism uh, trying to address that issue. What we need to understand what she says, this, you know, there is a condition which generates this unjust situation. And uh, in the transformative remedies basically should address this the conditions which generate this unjust situation and destabilize the hierarchies of identities. You have to destabilize it. It's not just mere uh, recognition of some policy like what you have in the affirmative remedies, which is a whole lot of affirmative action policies comes under that. Okay. She is talking about the transformative identity, uh, remedies where one has to address the source of unjust. And the source of unjust needs to be Address how do we address destabilize the hierarchies of identities, fundamentally altering the relations of production. So here she brings on the one hand she says destabilize the hierarchy of uh, identities. You know always uh, the heterosexuals are privileged over the homosexuals. Identities, you know one has to really the hierarchies needs to be destroyed. On the other hand, one has to fundamentally alter the relations of production. It means capitalism has to go, socialism has to come. So basically, what this Fraser concluded that the best way to negotiate the recognition, redistribution dilemma, would be to pursue transformative solution in both the domains. Okay. She insists that the transformative solution should be there in both the domains. It should be there in the recognition also. It should be there in the redistribution also. Redistribution should not just simply, okay, we have a good public good. We are, we are distributing it. Whether it's a benefit or a burden, take it like what Ron says, distribute it. There is no assurance that it would become a transformative in nature. Okay. So what uh, identity recognition politics. So you take uh, the recognition may be transformative or may not be transformative. Okay. So she has a suspicion that recognition, the identity may not be sometimes very transformative also. Transformative in a sense, it has to fundamentally uh, destabilize the hierarchies of identity. So Dalit movement, the caste question is addressed since the time of Buddha in India. All the time this is trying to question this hierarchy, but constantly we see this at various levels, this is uh, still, the system is still surviving. Transformation, what like what uh, uh, Ambedkar was saying is basically destroying the hierarchies of identities. Okay, that should be the transformative. Uh, so therefore, whether it is a, whether it's a recognition or redistribution, bring the element of transformation. Otherwise, there is no point in doing this. That's what uh, uh, she says. But the moment she said this, it's not. It didn't go without much criticism. There's a big, huge attacks attack from feminists, particularly postmodern feminists, and uh, the criticism is is basically very simple. Uh, 
basically what uh, they are the criticism is her approach fraser's approach effectively effectively resubordinated the politics of culture and identity to economic concerns so fraser is ultimately by saying transformative politics he is subordinating the entire recognition politics to the redistribution politics this is the very unfair criticism but that is that is what uh, they have done it and she basically equated recognition with affirmative remedy so when you look at affirmative remedies and transformative remedy what uh, feminists are saying this she basically equated recognition with affirmative remedy redistribution with the transformative remedy she said the same thing but in a different way that is what the criticism is because finally her interest is she is privileging the redistribution model of a marxism then the recognition model of the post okay so uh, in a sense the fraser's uh, concluding remarks in a sense uh, gives more importance to the distribution politics over the politics of identity this is the kind of a uh, criticism which uh, was leveled against her uh, we see that her approach was objected because uh, it has reduced justice uh, it has reduced justice to two dimension which seem to foreclose the consideration of the distinctive problem of political exclusion and inclusion and what uh, what they are saying is her approach basically was objected because it has reduced justice to two dimension okay what is this uh, two dimension justice can be understood in terms of political inclusion or exclusion okay so in a sense uh, you know when people make such criticism uh you now she went further and revised her entire theory in response to this criticism and fraser basically responded in her revised approach like this fraser integrates recognition and redistribution differently by treating them as irreducible dimensions of a single overarching idea of justice so now justice cannot be either said as recognition or justice cannot be simply said as a redistribution so what she is trying to do is it's irreducible dimension of a single overarching idea of justice also has so see which she is trying to do that which is expressed in his uh, in her concept uh, uh, called in the norm of parity participation she comes out with a concept called parity participation uh, the the norm of parity participation basically requires social arrangements that permit all members of society to interact with each other as peers and it has both objective conditions involving the distribution of wealth and other resources and intersubjective conditions involving the institutionalized pattern of value people that uh, the status of peers so what she says the parity of participation she brings a very kind of a irreducible thing justice should be should have both one when you when you create something called parity participation it, this is about parity participation it's referring to a social uh, arrangement that permits all members whether it's caste or gender all members or religion all members to interact with each other as peers as equals as peers and it has both objective conditions involving the distribution of wealth because once you say that uh, the parity you know equal everyone is equal you have a peers the peer for you know everyone is not someone is higher and someone is lower it's a peer group so other as a peer 
and uh, it has both objective condition according to her it has a both objective condition in terms of distribution of wealth so take it care the distribution justice distribution of wealth and other resources and intersubjective conditions involving the institutionalized pattern of the value that assign people the status of uh, peers what she says is that uh, when you created a parity participation, the parity participation either it can happen at the societal level as a social arrangement where you see that uh, distribution of wealth, distribution of resources equally, you know, that brings equality in the society. That is a justice. At the same time, make sure the social arrangement should make sure it should create an institutional arrangement which the actors, which the agents in the society, which the, the individuals or the people who are part of that social arrangement, institutionally safeguarded, institutionally, in I would say one step further, legally made to make sure that they are getting their self-respect. Okay. So justice should be both. Okay. So the institution like the Indian state legal system make sure it should not just simply stop with distributing reservation seats and uh, after getting reservation seats Dalits are humiliated like anything in India okay so this is this is not actually you know the state job doesn't end there the state job is to legally institutionally make sure that they have a dignity respect okay the parity participation she talks about here yeah, justice is both one has to have the recognition feel that they are being recognized not ill-treated at the same time they have to get the resource also from the system otherwise they can't just survive that is the justice says finally talking in terms of parity participation okay. so the par parity participation is the final solution she gave the response to them saying that she is not just merely privileging redistribution of goods redistributive paradigm but also concerned about the recognition so a system where you see objectively the resources are distributed a system where objectively, institutionally, the digni dignity, autonomy, integrity of individuals and communities are taken care of. That is the parity participation. That is justice work. That is Nancy Fraser's final response to this entire critics. There ends, in some sense, the debate. Debate followed. There many others responded to that also. But I'm stopping to take uh, questions. Thanks. So uh, we can take a five minute break. Break, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, and I'll, we'll give students time to think about their questions and put it out. Sure. sure, sure. We'll, we'll come back in. So it's right. about 11.57 by 12, 12.5 maybe. We will come back. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. And all the participants, please put in your questions. There can be questions about your own uh, work. There can be questions about how you can use what has been presented. Uh, you can think about how you would want to engage with this whole uh, paradigm that uh, Dr. Karan has given us. Uh, please type in your questions. So we will come back at 12.05 and we will take these questions. I also wanted to add that it will be good if you sort of uh, Hello. In terms of participation, so it is like uh, you know whether the whole issue of uh, recognition redistribution are, are are to be addressed only by researchers who are explicitly working in that field, or need to be somewhere uh, you know dwelled upon and worried about by irrespective of where you are doing your research. I do think there is a universal relevance to what Professor Kannan is saying, 
and it would be worthwhile if we also somewhat you know like i would say agitate on it or cogitate on it it would be uh, it would be useful at several levels dr kan can we get back So there are a couple of questions so i will read them out for you so the first question is uh, to deal with the problem of caste one of the points stated to address the question the source of injustice if the source of injustice lies in religion how should one approach it does any of the authors make any reference to religion so that was also something uh, that i also wanted to ask you that when we talk about when you said that this whole identity really came into sharp focus with the gay lesbian movement uh, what about the other markers of identity that existed before that how different are the markers of religion or race uh, or gender uh, different from the way in which the identity in terms of gay and lesbian movements brought it what what do you understand as the difference that this movement was had that the others are are different from it <clears throat> so uh, the about the source of the first question uh basically the obviously the source of caste uh, oppression caste system is religion and uh, there are uh, many Uh, scholars have uh, written about it uh, that the source of uh, caste oppression is religious sanctions or religious discrimination there's no doubt about that we don't have to uh, think uh, that much deep it's very very obvious thing and but uh, how to uh, really you know address that uh, people differ addressing the source gandhi addressed it differently in america addressed it differently in india western scholars addressed uh, the source of uh, oppression differently especially in the context of gender question but in the west it's not just uh, uh, mostly the source of oppression is not just mere religion but also uh, capitalism that led to the oppression whereas in indian context when it comes to caste system mostly the source of oppression most of the ambedkar followers ambedkar thinkers tend to say that the source of if religion hindu religion is not there then there, is, there won't be caste system that is uh, that kind of a theorizing uh, they do and uh, to greater extent that is true also i, I have no disagreements with them but at the same time the caste oppression also has certain class connotation also okay because what we found in india most of the uh, large number of dalits are the landless laborers large number of them are migrant laborers large number of them are bonded laborers mostly mostly adivasis and dalits are this major chunk so the source of oppression it's it's uh, by just merely talking about hindu religion it's, that is the main culprit but also we have to should not stop with that then because the source of oppression lies in the political economy also so that is a kind of a marxist reading of uh, caste system uh, you know scholars have reflected on this not just me there, there are many have reflected on this uh, but though we know the source of uh, oppression injustice but what transformative politics we are doing no idea how far the state is uh, helping in the transformative whether it's really helping the transformative politics or it is uh, creating more troubles for the marginalized we all know that what is happening in the real situation so that is my response to the first one and uh, uh, western thinkers have not uh, written much about uh, 
whoever returned on caste in India, their concern was different rather than just addressing this in terms of uh, trying to find the source. Okay. So that is a that's a different uh, level of uh, understanding. What Dr. Vasanthi is saying that the difference between the identity claims in the past and the, in the pre, uh, I would say that early modern and the post 60s. See, uh, even in the early modern context, also people were uh, talking about uh, their identities. And uh, they were looking for recognition. But only the difference is that uh, the identity at that point of time, uh, mostly, uh, you know, in a sense, either it was they were trying to articulate through some other medium, like uh, the black identity mostly articulated along with class lines, like what I'm saying, caste identity should be articulated on the class line and or you will just uh, uh, try to uh, look at identity in terms of certain universalistic paradigm okay like you have universal human rights paradigm that's a early modern way of addressing the racial question or various other uh, questions they had a universalistic paradigm uh, or in the postmodern language uh, they were talking all this is a meta okay. So, in the postmodern, is what they are saying these identities are highly fragmented in nature, identities are highly local in nature. It cannot be universalized, it cannot be completely, uh, you know, uh, seen as it has certain kind of a grand narrative of history. It's not that. So that is why we see the subaltern history in India here. Subaltern history is not about some long narration of history. It's a very moments. The moments are taken as part of history history, not necessarily a grand narrative of history. So for the postmodernists, we're basically saying this identity is very, very local in nature, very specific in nature. It's very context specific in nature. And uh, so therefore, this, uh, so when, when we talk about lesbian or gay uh, movement or LGBTQ, uh, you know, after that, I'm not sure what added recently. So what we see here, there are, uh, you know, universalist articulation in this. There are highly localized articulations. So when you talk about transgender, People talk about upper caste transgender and lower caste transgender. Muslim versus Hindu transgender. Privilege versus. So you see the multipleness of identities. So the intersectionalities, that's a new usage they found. Okay. So that is something which is very new in terms of how you position, politically position yourself. In the earlier context, it was different in terms of articulation of your identity in terms of universalist categories. That is the difference. Thank you. So the second question is a prominent concern that many caste scholars like Professor Tail Tumbe have is that while affirmative benefits like reservation help marginalized caste communities, the manner in which they are instituted they also in turn reaffirm the institution of caste. This makes the goal of transformative remedy, that is the annihilation of caste, more difficult. If this is true, how do we solve this difficulty? Is there any way we can change the way in which we institute affirmative remedies that help us? No, I don't know whether the affirmative policy in terms of reservation we have here is reinforcing the same caste system, I'm not sure. Maybe the caste system remains the same and uh, probably the affirmative action policies might help them to negotiate with uh, the power, negotiate with the cultural hierarchy in a better way. 
and uh, but at the same time i agree that the caste system still there still and but i'm i'm not sure how reservation itself is reinforcing that uh, i don't know what he uh, uh, refers to i'm not sure uh, <laughs> scholars like anand telkunte and whether uh, this the scholars there are many activists also saying that uh, that we don't want uh, uh, you know recently there was a move in tamil nadu which the union government finally agreed that uh, they don't want sc categorization for one particular major caste group in tamil nadu they don't want they want this caste group wanted the union government to remove their caste name from the list okay so because they claim that they the kind of a status they have they they don't uh, they don't want to be categorized under the sc list because sc has some kind of a denigration so they don't want to be classified under one group is saying the other group is saying that you know it's not that all of them under that particular caste group are well to do. so they still want reservation they their other group is saying please remove us from the sc list but we still need a reservation maybe classify us under maybe obc or some other category but not ac category. okay so you know people respond to this but i'm 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 not sure whether anand also said this that it reinforces the hierarchy or the caste system i'm not sure but reservation is one major we have seen it in indian history how this reservation policy helped the downtrodden to come up in their life especially obcs as well as sc st is not much scs they have done a lot they have come out okay so which is a constitutional mandate and it's it's part of the constitutional morality so by doing that it will reinforce the caste uh, again i'm not sure i'm seeing more possibility that it helps them to come out but what very often we see that now they are trying to attack or trying to destroy this constitutional protection and uh, that will reinforce the caste rather than the reservation in reinforcing the caste. I think the, the question that Abhinit uh, is raising, uh, I don't, even I'm not sure if it's coming from uh, Tiltum Dev, but there is, there is a lot of writing uh, about how does one see uh, reservation in terms of what are the any goal, any goal that has been reached or anything uh, measurable that we are able to see because of the reservation. And, uh, and all, of course, probably it's also speaking to the way in which the Supreme Court has begun to engage with this whole question uh, by saying, OK, unless you are able to show that there has actually been a lack of representation and if you don't show the demonstrate in facts and figures, right? that there has been no representation, then you cannot continue even the SC reservation. That's the gist of some of the judgments which have been coming in the recent time. Uh, and if you look at this entire uh, Maratha reservation uh, context also, then the whole reservation debate is being taken into a completely different, uh, in a completely different direction from the last 70 years. I mean, all along the way in which reservation has played out is to uh, understand the idea of exclusion from from power from you know all the various sources of social economic power but uh, what we are seeing with the entire maratha reservation is an affirmation of social and economic power through reservation uh, so perhaps he's speaking to you know in that context when you are looking at a very and that's that's the same thing with reference to the jat reservation as well when you're saying socially dominant groups claiming reservation, how does one see it in this? No, that's what one has to see that uh, that is that is where you have to invoke the concept of historical injustice. When you talk about historical injustice, you can't just even talk about uh, Marathas or uh, Patels or Gujars 
because uh, the kind of uh, humiliation, the kind of uh, historical injustice which Dalits faced is it cannot be equated with uh, because that becomes a ground for them to ask for reservation backwards. Uh, of course, they were all, you know, most of them were, uh, you know, forward caste groups, categorized under forward category. Now they wanted a OBC reservation under OBC categories because Maratha's case, they they are saying that uh, the SEs are doing better than us. Okay, it's a comparative uh, picture, and they wanted uh, that uh, space for them all. So just wanted to, uh, they wanted them to be included under OBC category. But I think it is uh, it is natural because once. Uh, you feel in, in, a, in a political context how you really you know distribute the uh, public good like uh, benefits reservation benefits so definitely the some caste will think that uh, they are their resources are taken away and given to somebody else okay so therefore they also wanted it so and but what uh, if the Supreme Court insists on uh, taking a very, you know, we'll take a, do a data collection, how far we reached in this, how you know, efficient we are, or how far we failed, all these things. And then uh, we say, okay, we have done enough for uh, SEs, the, therefore we stop uh, reservation. So if they proceed on those lines, the judges have absolutely no idea of Indian society. The judges have absolutely no idea of what is historical injustice. If they just to just simply go by the data, they will do the great injustice to marginalized. That for sure will happen. Okay. So uh, therefore, I'm 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 of the opinion that uh, see it is in a political expect you know domain it is very normal to you know climb a public group which is distributed because the other group feels that they are they have become unequals when the whole system is introduced to address the inequality and they are claiming that their resources are taken up so they also wanted something so it's quite natural for the caste groups to claim that but uh, the state the political civil society has to address that at a different level and uh, you know in some in some uh, say government uh, state governments are willing to include them under OBC if that is the case the major chunk say for example if uh, the uh, uh, Marathas are included under OBC category of Maharashtra they are numerically more in number they will take away they will demand the more it becomes a very caste specific reservation rather than the category specific reservation. They will take away the most. Okay. So that is a big headache for the state. So I don't know how, I have no ready made solution for this. This is what happening in Tamil Nadu also. So they have given reservation for one year, 10.5% reservation now under the OBC. They are the numerically dominant community in the North. If they get 10%, what is what is left for the other caste groups? Very all there are many caste groups in smaller numbers. They will not uh, get much. So again, these people will fight again. Okay. So I think the reservation is a site of political consciousness. Reservation is a site of negotiating justice, and it's very difficult to give one final solution at one point of time. It has to be always reinvented. It has to be addressed politically uh, at every stage. That's what I would say because there is no final solution for this. Yes. Uh, yes, Abhinit, you had uh, you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, uh, Professor. I uh, just uh, I think there was some confusion regarding what I was uh, uh, what I was asking. So if if we have the time, can I just read a short paragraph from Tiltumbre, which sort of raises the question which I'm talking about? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so uh, Professor, this is from uh, Professor Tiltumbre's Republic of Caste, and the paragraph goes like this: uh, the introduction of the book. Uh, the only motive with which Ambedkar wanted to enter the Constitutional Assembly was to 
was to preserve the safeguards he had earned for the Dalits. Reservations comprise a major part of these. While reservations are basically carried forward from the colonial regime, the post-colonial ruling classes cunningly honed them into a weapon of choice to perennially divide the people. Reservations became the pretext to conserve caste in the constitution. The biggest cause the Dalits have paid for the short-term gains of reservation is the compromise of their long-term goal of annihilation of caste. The opening chapter, Reservations, A Spark and the Blaze, demonstrates how it has become a weapon in the hands of the ruling classes. It does not automatically mean that they are inherently bad and should be discarded. The test of my argument is that even if Dalits were to demand their scrapping, the ruling classes would never let it happen. Again, it is important to remember that it is one thing to use them while knowing that they are a trap and quite another to treat them as heaven-sent solutions to a historical adversity. The cost of reservation far exceeds its benefits. So, Professor, this is the part. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I understood. That's what I was uh, trying to tell you. See, one sees the caste reservation as a trap. Okay. So what... Uh, Professor uh, Teldumde is saying that uh, reservation has created a, some kind of a dependency on the state. So that is my major criticism against uh, Dalit's uh, entire identity is depending on the state. Okay, so because uh, your entire human rights paradigm is actually you have to articulate your political agency within the human rights paradigm. So entire Dalit identity is predicated on the identity, the, the legal categories of rights, human rights. Okay. Is there any other way of addressing Dalit identity? What, what we see is over a period of time, reservation, you know, it's true that, it, you know, he wanted, uh, uh, that Ambedkar wanted it for some time. It should not be, you know, after some time, it should not create a stumbling block to oppose the caste system or annihilation of caste. It is perpetuating the caste. That's what the uh, you know, quote from Ambedkar gives. No, it is true. And in that context, it is it has created some kind of a trap and dependency on the state for one's own uh, emancipation. But uh, see, this, you know, if one has to really do a very realistic assessment, Okay, whether the, the idea which with uh, uh, Dr. Ambedkar said that whether we reached that point in terms of achieving, in a, you know, addressing some of the inequalities in, in the uh, economic and political and cultural domain, one has to do a very fair assessment and then say that uh, it should come from them. It should come from them that, okay, we have achieved this. You know, there is one has to question this paradigm of reservation because it number one, it is creating a dependency on the state. Number two, through this, we are prevented from addressing the source of oppression, that is the annihilation of the caste system itself. So I'm I'm saying basically the way Dalits understand caste is not they understand caste mainly to annihilate the caste, not perpetuate the caste. They want caste identity. That is, they say that we are uh, uh, Charma, Paraya, Pulaya. They assert their caste not because they wanted a caste system to perpetuate. The identity of caste in them is acting as a kind of an agency. Okay, in this case, uh, uh, Dalits asserting their own uh, caste, uh, one doesn't have to see that, uh, you know, it is basically, it will prevent them from addressing the caste system itself. I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, because one has to really think, one has to have a realistic assessment about this. I'm, theoretically, I am with uh, uh, Professor Tumte, saying that it, it created a, I, he, at least he says in the context of reservation, in my PhD work, I said that the entire Dalit identity is predicated on human rights. So therefore, the human rights movement, Dalit movement has become a human rights movement. It, it articulates its identity only within the state paradigm. So where is, so like I took Marx, Karl Marx's help in from Jewish question of Marx. 
saying that political emancipation is not human emancipation. That's what Marx said. So you might get your political emancipation in terms of getting civil and political rights, but that will not lead to human emancipation. So said same thing Ambedkar said in a different context, in a different thing. Okay. So one has to work towards human emancipation rather than the political emancipation. That was that was my in my thesis I have argued. That. The same thing is said in a different context. Okay. So theoretically I am with him, but practically is it really perpetuating uh, the caste system, or it will not? You know, it, this is the right time to completely break away from this. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I I still see a lot of people need uh, preservation to come up. One has to do uh, a good survey and one has to do a All India study, which is a very difficult thing in Indian context to do it. But if it comes from them, now I'm saying them means if the Dalits come out and say that this is the symbol of, uh, you know, it is the system itself is perpetuating, then we should we should that. Till that point, uh, the others should not uh, talk about it. That's what my position is. Since uh, Tumde is a uh, Dalit intellectual, if he says there is a validity in it, I have never seen others saying this. Uh, are we taking more questions? Yes, yes. You know, you have to ask. Uh, yeah, uh, Professor, I just had uh, one question with regard to uh, this entire conversation around caste data and uh, unavailability of such data to make uh, informed choices about reservation policies. Uh, Professor, what is your uh, view on this? Like, where are we in terms of? Uh, how much data we have uh, with rega regard to the caste question and, and how, how do we make decisions on that? Are we just making decisions based on uh, informed hunches because we do not have uh, the required data or time? Or is there uh, some uh, meaningful framework from which, uh, I, I don't know, maybe the sample surveys from which we can obtain the data that is required to make uh, policy decisions? No, I see we need we need a good data, especially uh, we don't have that kind of that level of data. And uh, you know we may have we may have aggregate data and in the census report and certain various aggregate data. You don't get disaggregate data. And what we need is a very, very specific data on the educational attainments their uh, their job or their, their uh, asset, uh, asset building, all those very minute details we want across the region, across India. And that is a massive work. I don't think uh, any uh, state government is interested in doing it. Maybe as uh, Telugu uh, Day says, because they don't, they will not do it because they want this. Uh, reservation politics to run so that they will get the vote. They might do that, but I think at some point uh, one has to do it, if at all if you are very serious about addressing uh, reservation. And mostly what I am saying is that uh, by just looking at uh, uh, people who are excluded from so-called privileged institutions and uh, so-called privileged, uh, you know, entrance exams and you saw that most of the people who are excluded from are from either rural or Dalits and only these two categories that itself is a big data for you that still these people have not even reached a certain point in their education and even if they reach education if they get education they are not recognized and uh, you bring whole lot of other criteria to just simply them out. And uh, you have to take a very, very detailed study, research, data for India, Indian population, this much uh, geographical 
it's very difficult uh, thing so only thing it, it at some point we have to start this process and who will start this no idea and uh, what we are saying most of the uh, scholars who are working on caste inequality are saying still we see inequalities okay in terms of access to education access to justice access to uh well still there is inequality so reservation is not just giving them job and uh, giving them education reservation has a wider meaning of bringing some amount of equality so it de it depends on what how do you define equality now i am definitely I'm, i will not agree that equality is giving them education and job so even after giving education and the job and they are just ill treated it's no equality reservation is just only one instrument to address this but if you remove that also now it's gone gone forever the question of counting uh, applies both ways which is what a lot of people a lot of the supreme court judgments and other people are not looking at the counting is not only counting uh, the reserved categories counting is also counting who who is actually benefiting right and that is a count that uh, we are very wary of so we are we are not wanting to count how many generations of forward castes have uh, uh, have been in civil services in what positions and The that kind of counting we don't want to do we want to only one green layer issues <laughs> so we are not looking at the other kind of counting we want to do only one kind of counting so if we saying data the data has to be for everyone no? yeah so it is not applicable for brahmins exactly <laughs> so we are not going to count how many brahmins are in what services in what positions and where they are even on brahmin even the non brahmin upper caste yeah but we are we are uh, because there's a i don't know if you've seen this but there's a plea in the supreme court saying that the entire sachar committee which had done this whole counting business with reference to muslims is unconstitutional so we are we don't want to count also i mean so at one level where we have done the counting for one huge group we are saying that, that is that was a entirely wrong exercise and even there they were not given data in terms of the army and the police the data was simply not collected the data was only collected for other for other employments in other areas and even that we are trying to on one hand that is a data that we don't want to <laughs> use and then we say that there is no data on this and we don't know how to collect data on this you had that resistance even in relation to the census no where yeah. they wanted to bring in the whole category of caste and it was said oh no just to even find out where we are is being casteist so and you know at, it, it it's like uh, when you have that kind of uh, i suppose endemic uh, systemic discrimination it's not going to be something which is going to be easily allowed to be uh, De destructured or removed, and I think I mean Kanan has a very valid point that you know when uh, it's the point which uh, Professor Teltumbe is making, it's like you can he can make it as a Dalit scholar, but if you otherwise try to make it, the number of people who would say yes, 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 reservation should go. So the one symbolic thing also you are doing goes, and nothing else also happens. so the movement needs to be it, this has to be an initiative which has to come internally and i i agree that you know uh, but the point i'm uh, you know like uh, vasanthi's point about counting privilege is one the other aspect is also i think how much of recognition privilege needs to have of its own privilege you know you want to talk in terms of reservations and you want to talk about discrimination but you don't want to talk about like how you are uh, you know kind of each of us in our own way are reinforcing that institution that was where i felt that this talk had a larger relevance for you know what is the kind of research that we do um, what sort of topics we register and not just in terms of you know frontal issues where caste is taken frontally but how it is like embedded in virtually everything you do 
for me that was that's that's very very important and each of us needs when I mean, every one of us is not conscious of it you're not even conscious of the extent of privilege that you just take for granted and uh some level of uh, to to borrow the word it, it's a different kind of recognition but it's a recognition which i think is needed you know so that's that's how i would at least situate today's discussion both ways you know like it needs to be seen because unless and until it comes both ways we don't really move forward in in a robust conversation kind of stuff so are we done vasanthi or we have questions no i think we don't have any other questions here but of course we can ask if any of the participants wants to unmute themselves and ask any question it's an open house all right then i would say uh, thank you very much kanan it was like uh, as always i mean uh, whenever you speak the rest of us get educated too so it's like uh, thank you so very much and thank, thank you uh, participants for turning in and for this very kind of i would say reflective questions abhijit especially i mean your questions and your discussion was very welcome so thank you very very much uh, we are continuing with the series and we have we're talking in terms of researching corporations in the the next talk which is being happening on the 7th of august and it will be interesting that you're going to see that um, uh vijaya nagraj is not going to be looking at corporations also from the very typical lens she is going to be looking at issues of you know equality diversity social justice also in the context of corporations so look forward to i hope many of you join us and let other people know also it will be helpful for us if you kind of feedback uh you know however many of you have participated as to what the whole process was like because for nalsar to institutionalize it people who benefited from it if they let us know what worked or did not work it would help us in the future years thank you so very much thank you professor kanan thank you vasanthi effectively done as always bye bye thank you thank you ma'am thank you sir